Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Academic Symposium. My name is Julie Bidwell. I'm an assistant professor in the Family Caregiving Institute, and I will be moderating the session this morning. These are the Masters in Leadership Thesis Panel Presentations. We'll be presenting our um, our panels in groups. We have three wonderful panels for you this morning. In each panel, the students will present sequentially with no breaks between and no interruptions from me. And then after all three students have presented, we will have five minutes for panel Q&A before we move on to the next panel. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panel. Our first panel includes Wendy Scott, Wendy thesis chair is Dr. Amy Nichols, Felix Piamonti, Felix's thesis chair is Dr. Taeyun Kim, and Laura Juarez. Laura's thesis chair is Dr. Jessica Dron Moret. Wonderful. Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Bidwell. I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay, good morning. My name is Wendy Scott and my thesis apply is an applied project created to prioritize healthcare worker safety when resuscitating patients with COVID-19. Code blue is a term used in the hospital when patients are in cardiac or respiratory arrest and healthcare workers perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR to increase chances of survival. Historically, during a code blue, healthcare workers would rush inside the room and start CPR. However, COVID-19 changed how rescuers prioritized their safety by properly donning PPE before entering the room. When minutes matter to increase survival, it became necessary to, to balance the need to delay starting CPR to ensure rescuer safety. I conducted a literature review to see how healthcare workers perform CPR with COVID-19 patients. 14 articles revealed three common themes and included reducing provider exposure during CPR, decision-making and goals of care, and simulation training. Strategies for reducing healthcare worker safety and their exposure during CPR included limiting the number of rescuers inside the room, making sure airborne PPE is worn correctly, and using airway techniques that reduce COVID droplets from aerosolizing. A powered air purifying respirator or PAPR is the highest level of airborne PPE and should be worn inside the room while completing aerosol generating procedures or AGP like CPR. Decision making and goals of care discussions of what patients would like to be done if their heart were to stop were recommended ideally before they were sick, but if coming in for COVID-19 treatment, providers should prioritize code status and goals of care. Finally, simulation training helped many hospitals practice resuscitating COVID-19 patients using enhanced airborne precautions and many were completed in situ or in the clinical environment so teams could identify issues. And debriefing helped the staff learn from each simulation. Gaps identified were that the PPE varied. There were different amount of teams inside and outside the room and closed loop communication was challenging because of the closed door. Enhanced CPR safety mock code training addressed the gaps identified and had five team members inside the room wearing pappers and communicating through a closed door with wireless earbuds to the outside team members. Simulations utilized the National League of Nursing Jeffrey's simulation framework using American Heart Association resuscitation guidelines and CDC recommended precautions for resuscitating COVID-19 patients. Inside and outside the room teams had assigned roles. A PPE code cart housed pappers and airway supplies needed to reduce droplet aerosolization and wireless earbuds connected to the rapid response nurse's phone were used for closed loop communication. The first responder who found the patient in cardiac or respiratory arrest starts compressions only CPR. until relieved by the five essential staff wearing pappers and will then leave the room to decrease their viral exposure. With the help of the medical IC director at the hospital that I work for, we created enhanced CPR safety mock code blue simulation training 
consisting of a 15 minute PowerPoint presentation discussing the code blue changes created to prioritize staff safety, followed by two simulation scenarios and then debrief reflections. Here is an example of the objectives and scenario that I created for the training. The template assisted essential inside the room staff understand the resuscitation roles. Additionally, the guide helped the outside team members understand the roles assisting the five essential inside staff members retrieve equipment, emergency medications, and documenting the code blue while using closed loop communication with the rapid response nurse inside the room. Additionally, I created a facilitator guide for the simulations to keep a consistent model during the training. The guide discussed the scenario pre-brief instructions and had a debrief guide for facilitators to utilize during the simulation training. Healthcare workers have the highest level of contracting COVID-19 with reported viral infections as high as 20% in some countries when proper PPE was not done correctly. Along with debriefing after simulations, I created a survey monkey to assess how staff felt about the training simulations. 76% of the participants perceived the objectives were extremely or very clear. 83% of participants replied that the staff was, that the training was relevant, extremely relevant or very relevant. And 69% felt very comfortable or somewhat comfortable participating in a code blue. Enhanced CPR safety mock code training aimed to implement safe practices by minimizing staff inside the room and used airway techniques to reduce aerosolization. The lessons learned helped guide future simulations for the hospital and created a platform for roles and teamwork during all Code Blue resuscitations. Thank you. Are there any questions? We're gonna hold questions to the end of the panel. Felix, um, you can go ahead and get started. Are you able to share your screen? Do you guys see the screen? I can see it. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Felix uh, Piemonte, and uh, I'm here to present to you my project titled Safe Removal of Secure Cat Device, a guide module for nurses and medical providers. So as a background, we're going to have to do a little bit of a definition of terms so that we can fully understand the concept of this project. So as a vascular access nurse, I deal daily with pick line placements and management and troubleshooting. Peripherally inserted central catheters or pick lines are becoming more common form of central venous access in hospitals for a short term to a long term period. It's commonly used to deliver critical care medications, monitor cardiac function, fluid recess, laboratory workup, and home inpatient therapy. It is typically secured by sutures and adhesive locks and subcutaneously engineered device called SecureCat, which is the main subject of this study. So current practice in the Bay Area Hospital where I work, we utilize full-time SecureCat devices as the primary securement for our lines. There have been well-established research of its efficacy in Europe and the United States. And since then, uh, since May 2019, it has been incorporated in the central line bundle insertion. So what problem did I see during the implementation of this device? There was a knowledge gap identified among clinical nurses and medical providers on how to safely remove the secure cat. There was no formal training that was set in place to train the, the nurses and the medical providers during the rollout. And only two different units, specifically the hematology and oncology department nurses were trained to safely remove it, although competence is still in question. Different clinical cultures and functions influence the reception and perception on the device. And vascular access support team, our department, is always on call to provide the service on the removal of the device. There have been mounting discharge delays due to unavailability of nurses or medical providers who are trained in performing the task. 
literally there is actually zero medical providers who are trained to perform the task. Increasing patient dissatisfaction due to pain and discomfort during removal and a risk of patient injury is imminent when unsupervised and untrained personnel performs the job. And they're not able to troubleshoot when complications arise when a device is stuck. As a perspective, here is a picture of how the device is actually implanted under the patient's skin. As you can see, a metallic prong that is anchored in a subcutaneous tissue, which will eventually hold that white catheter to secure the PIC line. And this is the reason why a careful training and education is important when it comes to this task. So the project goal is to create an educational module that focuses on live bedside teaching that will utilize procedural videos and return demonstrations using the demo box prior to the actual patient procedure. Just in time teaching at the bedside, we focus on the anatomy of the secure cat device and its mechanics. There are video assisted learning that are provided, each one lasting for less than two minutes, and a practice on the removal itself using an actual device on a demo box. And at the end of the teaching, there is going to be a quick recall or a QR code scanning for SecureCat app that a nurse or a medical provider can download for free in their smartphone or in regards to the UCSF uh, system, uh, they have agreed to actually download the app themselves for nurses quick reference when this education starts to roll. Our expert reviewers were also consulted on the content of the module prior to the implementation of this project. Convenient sampling was utilized in choosing the participants. The PIC line removal request does not come often, and hence a convenient sampling was utilized to actually choose the participants. And they're more than likely the, the nurse assigned to that patient is the one who is going to participate in this procedure. A five-point Likert scale type question satisfaction survey was conducted after the training. And all the data were actually stored in the Microsoft Excel. And the training will only be supervised by a vascular access nurse specialist. Results. From, from, May to, uh, from April to May of this year, Seven participants were successfully trained, including one nurse practitioner. RN participants were med search nurses in the facility where the project was implemented. A team of four physicians were actually trained and were able to uh, watch the video, but they were unable to perform the procedures to an emergency call. And after the survey was conducted, there was 100% participation, participant satisfactory. Discussions and limitations. Implementation is limited to UCSF or NASA's campus only and not all hospitals with vascular access specialist team uses secure cat device. Felix, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I feel awful. If we could save your, impl uh, your implications until maybe the Q&A, we really have to move on to the next presentation. That's I fine. wish we had more time. Excellent no work. Problem. Thank That's you so much. <laughs> Great That's job. Fine. All right, Laura, you're our next presenter. Please go ahead. Oh, um, Emily, let me share my screen um, as long as Felix is, is still up there. Okay. It's just saying you cannot share your screen while the other participant is sharing. Okay. There we go. I think our... Uh, great. Sorry. Thank you, Laura. Okay, so hi, my name is Laura, um, and my, for my master's thesis, I created a peer-centered discussion-based informal response tool called PEERS that's intended to address emergency department nurses' experiences of workplace violence and to provide support to them and other team members after emergency co-grays in the ED. 
Workplace violence is any physical or verbal violent action or threat of violence that occurs while a person is at work. These can include being cursed at, spit at, punched, or kicked. Nurses often spend the most time providing direct patient care, making them one of the most at-risk groups for workplace violence, with patients being among the top perpetrators. A code gray is a hospital emergency code that alarms staff of a violent or combative person with no observed weapon. When a code gray is called staff, in-house security and police will respond to the event. Typically, the response involves verbal de-escalation or a more hands-on approach that results in the placement of a person in physical restraints, administration of chemical restraints, or both. Why the ED for this project? Because the ED is one of the most highly reported settings of workplace violence, with some of the reasons being um, patients under the influence of drugs and alcohol or with psychiatric illness that may they may have been taken into the ED involuntarily, long waits, small spaces, and open 24 access to the community. Nurses are impacted by workplace violence as psychological effects um, like post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, anxiety, depression can occur, and disruptions in lifestyle behaviors such as decreased sleep or increased food and alcohol intake. Organizations can be affected as the quality of care can decrease and staff turnover can increase. My approach to making the peers tool included exploring the targeted hospitals to formal support resources through meetings with the directors of these programs. I also took the hospital's ED debriefing champions class to find out what existing support there was. And I presented the preliminary draft to the ED safety committee to find if there was an interest or perceived need for this tool. And the feedback I got was that they felt that there was a need. My findings from a literature review focused on debriefing um, and included the workplace culture in the ED. Nurses believe that violence was inevitable and part of the job. They feared being viewed as inadequate or having coping mechanisms um, or poor coping mechanisms by leadership or others if they needed help. They often cope with emotions by covering them with their busy, fast-paced workloads. I also found that the ED perceived debriefing to be beneficial and effective. However, it was not practiced often or effectively. Barriers included lack of time, training, and guidance. The importance of peer support was also highlighted in the literature. Peers are a low resource support system. Peers naturally gravitated towards other peers and were found to help decrease stress and process emotions through informal discussion after critical events. The frameworks chosen for this project included a combination of critical incident stress debriefing and psychological first aid inspired by the hospital's support programs. And it was also important to make the tool feasible for the targeted ED's specific environment by addressing barriers. This is the peer support tool that I created in the form of a badge buddy. The goal of this tool is to A, create a space for nurses to ventilate their feelings that fits their workflow and allows them to transition between the event and returning to their duties. B, build a therapeutic environment that does not support the current culture of violence in the workplace. And C, potentially mitigate the negative consequences of violence on nurses. The peer tool is a user-friendly 10-minute guided informal conversation that includes a five-step process that takes place when safe immediately after code gray. PEER stands for present ground rules, encourage safety, explain the event, reactions and reflections, and support and step away. This tool was built to be simple so that any staff member, not just clinical members, could lead a response after training. The back of the card includes ground rules and additional support resources. Limitations are that this tool is not intended to serve as a diagnostic evaluation or treatment for psychological disorders. It is informal. It's a guided discussion meant to serve as a bridge to more formal services if needed. Um, it is time limited, so nurses may desire more time to express themselves and process an event. And while peer support can be beneficial to coping, this environment may not be for everyone. People must be comfortable expressing their true reactions around an event, um, knowing it will be kept confidential. Um, the tool was not implemented for my thesis. However, my next steps would be to create a training program for the tool and pilot the training with the ED Safety Committee. The goal of the training would be to increase staff confidence and familiarity using the tool so that they'll feel more knowledgeable and comfortable initiating a response amongst their peers through a simula simulation. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Wonderful, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this panel is now open for questions and I have a question uh, for Wendy. Um, the first question is, did
Did your simulation get implemented in the clinical setting, perhaps the ER? Yes, it, um, not in the ER, sorry. It did get implemented in all the, um, in the rest of the hospital, you, uh, the telemetry unit and the med surge unit. Um, it was part of a disaster preparedness for um, the COVID-19 umbrella uh, last year. And I kind of hopped in on um, the implementation of that and um, assisted. I was, I was fortunate because um, I was a rapid response nurse at the time. And um, so we were able to provide um, many simulations for the hospital. Great, thank you. Do we have any more? Oh, I see one in the... Excellent, thank you. Question uh, from the chat. I want to hear Felix's implications, so do I. Felix, can you share your implications, please? Thank you. So this uh, project was actually implemented uh, since it's, it's been a part of the flow of the vascular access department. I had incorporated this towards the, the, the removal of the security cat device. And um, since the device is exclusively applied for a pick line placement, so I believe we're the only uh, hospitals in the Bay Area that actually utilizes it uh, full time. For future uses of this device, actually, uh, the, the different sizes are now available for securement of the other forms of central vascular access devices, such as central lines and pigments. But we are not there yet uh, in terms of uh, application. Uh, in some hospitals, particularly in Europe, this device is also used to secure external ventricular drains and neurosurgical patients, uh, which is which according to the studies is seem to be a lot better and more secure in terms of suturing the line, which predisposes the line for more infection. Um, so this training can also be included in the management of uh, vascular access management classes that we are planning to do. Uh, then that would include new hires and medical providers that will be coming to the facility. And lastly, uh, there is a cheat sheet that we have that I have created that we call it a discharge form sheet that will have a home health uh, advisory with a 24 seven live clinical consultation and a number in there that is available for clinical assistance for home health nurse who do not have any access to a nearest clinical uh, clinic or a hospital that have trained personnel. Uh, and in that cheat sheet, there's actually a QR code that they can download in their smartphones. And once they download that one, it will give them a menu. And one of the menu would be the three different uh, videos that will guide you on how to properly and safely remove this device. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank I have you. one last question. I wanna make sure we get a question for Laura and I have a great one. Laura, did you find out if any nurses had experienced workplace violence, but had been afraid to bring it up with supervisors? Yeah, so actually this was one of the common themes that I actually found in my literature review. There's sort of a stigma around um, the ED and feeling like you're not able to cope with some of the things that happened there. Um, it was almost seen like a weakness if you needed help or that you weren't fit for that environment because you weren't able to adapt or cope to things that were quote unquote part of the job. Um, and so, yeah, I, I did find this a uh, common theme, um, you know, part of, and part of the ED workplace um, culture. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everyone, wherever you are, let's have a round of applause for our first panel. Uh, thank you and congratulations on your excellent work, Wendy, Felix, and Laura. Now I'd like to introduce our second panel. Our second panel includes Riza Magat, uh, Riza's thesis chair is Dr. Taeyoon Kim. Nadine Fabro Brown. Nadine's thesis chair is Dr. Deb Bakurjian. And Ali Baruman. Ali's thesis chair is Dr. Heather Young. Riza, will you please start us off? Thank you, Dr. Bidwell. Um, can you guys see my screen? It just looks white to me. 
How about now? I see your cursor, but it's a white background. Oh. Sorry. Is it still white? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought I. That's okay. Would you like me to move on to one of the next presenters while yes, you figure please. things out? Yes, please. Okay. Nadine and Ollie, um, would either of you like to jump in and go next? I can go. Excellent. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Nadine Fabro Brown, and I am here to present a proposal for a quality improvement project to implement a multi component fall prevention strategy in the acute care setting using the model for improvement framework from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, IHI, and IHI's framework for spread. Oh. Yeah. 700,000 to a million individuals fall in US hospitals every year. Over one third of hospital falls cause patient harm, such as fractures and head trauma. One in 20 falls can result in serious injury. Cost of a single serious fall related injury is estimated at about $15,100 as of 2016. Organizations do not get paid for any fall related expenses and death or severe injury from an inpatient fall is a never event based on Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services guidelines. The target setting for this project is three acute care units at a 245-bed magnet-designated community hospital in Northern California. Patient population in these units comprise of individuals ages 18 years old and above. To design the project, the hospital's current fall data was reviewed and analyzed. As you can see in this slide, in quarter four, all three acute care units falls per 1,000 patient days went above national benchmark. Unit two and unit three's falls were consistently above national benchmark for the last four quarters. And the goal is to be below benchmark. For the purpose of this project, we focused on the last two quarters of fall reports. We saw an increase in an unassisted falls as well as falls during change of shift. According to literature, unassisted or unwitnessed falls increases patients' risk for fall-related injuries. Falls related to toileting, climbing out of bed, and attempting to reach for something increased from quarter three to quarter four. Toileting is one of the top fall contributing factors found in literature. Based on acute care's current fall condition, SMART goals were developed not only to decrease the overall falls, but to specifically decrease toileting related and unassisted falls by 25%. After establishing the project aims, the hospital's current fall prevention strategies were reviewed. Opportunities for improvement within the organization were identified. There had been an inconsistency in staff compliance with some of the current fall prevention practices, particularly in performing hourly rounding. There was a lack of standardization and communication among staff of patients' fall risk factors and prevention plans. There was also a lack of standardized mobility assessment tool to guide staff with safe patient handling. And finally, there is no standard of practice surrounding proactive toileting. A review of literature was conducted to find evidence-based fall prevention strategies that would help address the organization's current needs. A multi-component fall prevention strategy was then designed and proposed to the stakeholders. A proposal was made to revise the current purposeful hourly rounding practice, which includes redesigning the patient's whiteboard to reassure patients that staff will be there regularly to help address their needs. The process change also includes involving the resource nurse or break nurse in ensuring consistency in practice. A standardized scheduled toileting practice was also proposed. The use of Banner Mobility Assessment Tool or BMAT, which is a quick four-step mobility assessment tool that helps guide the user to assess the patient's level of mobility and identify appropriate support and needed equipment to mobilize patients safely based on their mobility level was also proposed in addition to measures promoting patient mobility. Fall tips or tailoring intervention for patient safety, which is an evidence-based patient-centered fall prevention intervention incorporating a three-step process of identifying patients' fall risk factors through performing fall risk assessments, creating an individualized fall prevention plan, and consistently implementing the individualized plan in conjunction with universal fall precautions was also recommended. 
IHI's model for improvement framework and IHI's framework for spread will help guide the implementation of the post fall prevention strategies. The project was presented to the acute care stakeholders for feedback. The stakeholders acknowledged the significance of the proposed project and its implications. The team appreciated that the proposed project included an overview of the hospital's current state and was supported by a review of literature. The potential implications of the project proposed on other patient outcomes such as pressure ulcers was also acknowledged. Some of the work in progress which, which within the organization was discussed to see how the proposed project might impact them. Some of the potential implementation challenges perceived by the stakeholders included financial constraints and potentially overwhelming staff with competing new initiatives. The proposal was written during the COVID-19 pandemic and was presented to the acute care leadership team for pilot testing approval in December 2020, when California was at the height of the coronavirus surge. At the time, it was critical for the hospital to activate its surge protocol and adapt to the rapid changes brought upon by the pandemic. For this reason, pilot testing and implementation of the proposed quality improvement project remains to be determined. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine. Looks like uh, Riza has uh, solved the problem and so she's gonna go next. Thank you, Riza. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, I'll do it again. So Jen is going to share my screen. Yes, uh, if they, I think Nadine, can you stop sharing? Thank you. Just a second. Okay, that's very odd. I am also having trouble. Just a second. Okay. I don't understand why her file is not showing up. I have nothing to share. So I'm going to ask that our next presenter go ahead and start. All right, that would be Ollie. Ollie, are you able to go? Um, I hope so. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. It might take a second for me to share. So let me share. Oh, hold on. There it is. So if I'm sharing my screen. Um, I can't see it, so I haven't figured out how y'all do that, but can you guys? It looks like it's thinking about yes. it. There it is. Perfect. Yes. Wait, can you hear me? We can yes, we yeah. can. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, so my name is Ollie Baruman, and um, my thesis is titled "Promoting Cardiovascular Health: Addressing Barriers to Implementing the Mediterranean Diet." I am trying to try and be as quickly as I can here. Okay. So in the symposium discussion, I did want to just define the Mediterranean diet. The theme I found over and over and over again was that defining the Mediterranean diet can be really tricky. Um, and then how the Mediterranean diet can be used to transform illness and then just touch on the solution that I came for implementing the diet. So defining the Mediterranean diet, um, you know, I think the most important thing to know here is that it's the traditional way of eating. Um, for people for millennia, and that's really throughout the Mediterranean region, and we're talking about 25 countries here with different types of things that they have in common, helpful ideas and practices um, that people of the Mediterranean region put into use every day. Um, it was first coined by a biologist, Ansel Keys, and in 1951, he was studying data on morbidity and mortality in post-war Europe, and he was surprised to notice a significant drop in acute coronary attacks in certain countries. And at the same time, he was aware of the high rates of heart attacks in middle-aged businessmen in the United States. And so he came to suspect the diet can be related to CBD. He presented it to the WHO in 1955 and was met with much skepticism and even challenged at the time by a world-famous cardiologist. 
Um, and it wasn't until 1993 when Harvard School of Public Health and the European Office of the WHO helped create the Mediterranean Diet Pyramid that we most recognize today. Now. Oh, hello? Okay. Um, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, diet as we know it, like in what people consume and consume daily, that's actually the leading killer of adults in the United States. And the med diet is known as the healthiest in the world, and particularly because it's more of a lifestyle that participates um, with a lot of physical activity and social activities. And in fact, studies support the essence of the med diet success as being physically active, enjoying, and sharing meals. And I just did want to highlight that um, one of the sayings that is found in every single language within the Mediterranean region is that you should choose who you eat with before you choose what you eat. Um, not eating alone, creating dates. Uh, lunch dates, dinner dates with family, friends, neighbors, and so forth. Um, they're seeing the enormous uh, psychological benefits, and they're finding this more and more within the data as they're studying the Mediterranean diet. Um, staying active, whole foods, and I think I'd better go to the other slide. <laughs> okay, so this is the Mediterranean diet um, pyramid, and this is a great photo that um, I've copied and pasted. I could really have done my entire research project just on this uh, slide alone. Um, so if there is any time, we can question and answer about this. But I just want to highlight real quick on the shape of it. You've got your meats and sweets and poultry and yogurts and stuff on the top. Consume the smallest. And then you have physical activity, fruits, grains at the middle um, to be consumed the most with fish in the center. Um, and there is a 2011 study that found that one extra serving of fish can reduce heart disease by 50%. Um, another study conducted on heart disease focused just on women found that women who did not eat fish had a 50% greater risk of heart disease, high cholesterol, and hypertension compared to those who ate fish just once a week. And the fish that's mostly consumed in the Mediterranean region is salmon, tilapia, and swordfish. Um, but one interesting fact really quick is that 70% of modern-day medical cures were mentioned in ancient Egyptian texts meaning that 70% of what was available in ancient Egypt and their own medical treatments we have found and have medically proven to be true today. That was published in the um, British Pharmaceutical Codex. Uh, what shall, should I mention? Oh, I want to talk about this slide so much. Um, grains kind of get a really bad rap in the United States because we don't use them properly. They're used as fillers and in processed foods, but they are actually very healthy. And there um, was a study conducted in uh, the Cleveland Clinic uh, 2,000 people were, when they added three and a quarter ounces of high fiber whole grains to their diet per week, they found a reduction in obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. Um, and then we can't talk about the Mediterranean diet without talking about olive oil. Um, it is throughout the Mediterranean region, and they did find that olive oil prevents the formation of blood clots. It lowers the levels of total blood cholesterol, and it boosts your immune system. So it totally earns its name as being the green gold um, throughout history. Uh, illness improved by the Mediterranean diet, we touched a little bit on, but I'll just say that um, people who follow the Mediterranean diet are 40%, 47% less likely to develop heart disease. Um, and there was a study done of over 7,000 people in 2013 that had a 30% um, reduced occurrence of heart attacks after they switched to the Mediterranean diet. Um, the gap. So this slide is actually kind of just sums up. I, of course, I can't show it because of time, but the NYU Langoon Medical Center um, is discussing a study that they conducted and presented at the American College of Cardiology Conference, where they learned a great deal about the attitudes and feelings of physicians regarding diet. Um, specifically the Mediterranean diet. But the most important information found in the study was that physicians don't particularly feel adequately trained to counsel patients on the diet as it relates to cardiovascular disease. Hey, Ollie, so I'm so sorry to interrupt. I oh my gosh, um, have no you a little way. bit over. We're a um, little Dang short it. of time. Can you uh, it's okay. tell I tried, us? You wait, guys, wait, wait. I I'm going to have you. Can you tell, <laughs> tell us in 30 seconds what you okay. did and what the biggest yeah. contribution is? So I created a video to try and close the gap. It's an introductory and educational cooking video with two quick, easy recipes on the Mediterranean diet. Um, and I have all kinds of links and recipes. Um, I also created a website, an Instagram page, hashtag MedDietLife to help all the resources come together so that people can find help. Um, I implemented it. I did a survey, I showed the video, and thank you to everyone who helped um, Dr. Young, Dr. Katz, and Dr. Bidwell. <laughs>
Excellent. Thank you so much. All I've right. Got, I've so, got my speed talking. <laughs> all right. So um, our final presenter for this panel is Riza. I'll ask uh, Jenny and Riza, have we, um, yeah, please post your website, Ollie, someone says in the chat. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, have we solved the presenter problem with um, uh, Riza's, pre Riza's presentation? We're working on it right now. I think it's a file size issue and Jenny is trying to pull it up on her computer as we speak. Okay. Can I so try I think to share my screen? See if it's going to not show us a wipeout now? Yes. Please. You can give it a try. Okay. How about um, you seeing... We do see your screen, but it looks like um, how about now the internet, but we don't see your file yet. I'm it, it's up on my screen right now. You still can't see it. No, we just see no, the we website. See a screen. I'm going to stop share Dr. Bidwell. OK, so here's what I think we're going to do since Zoom is not cooperating. It's like looks like it's taken an early break for the weekend <laughs> is we'll move on to the next panel of three. But Riza, I'm going to have you go at the end of the next panel of three. Okay. Um, we're pretty behind at this point. So I think I'm going to forego Q&A for um, this group. And I'm very sorry to do that because that's the funnest part. But we'll see at the end if we can reclaim some time and do Q&A for everyone. So our third panel is um, Michelle Yang. Uh, Michelle thesis chair is Dr. Susan Adams. Sarah Stallins, Sarah's thesis chair is Dr. Jan Ray Garcia, and Shail Prasad, and Shail's thesis chair is Dr. Jan Marie Garcia also. So Michelle, are you ready to start us off? Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Checking again, can everybody see the screen? Um, so thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Bidwell. Uh, the purpose of my thesis project was to create a limit setting module for pre-licensure nursing students as preparation for workplace violence incidences in the healthcare setting. So in 2019, the American Nurses Association began their End Nurse Abuse Campaign and published several alarming statistics about workplace violence. First, one in four nurses are assaulted in the workplace, and only 20 to 60% of workplace violence incidences are reported. In their professional issues brief, the American Nurses Association suggested that nursing programs could also help with the issue by teaching nursing students to identify and manage workplace violence situations. In the literature, there were only 10 studies published that implemented some form of workplace violence prevention training in nursing schools globally. Currently, there are no studies on de-escalation or limit setting training implemented in nursing programs. How, however, in the 10 articles, the overarching theme between the studies was that uh, there, it was important to introduce new theory content with a practice activity. So for example, if you're introducing uh, theory content on de-escalation, you should follow it up with a practice activity such as a role play or simulation for students to practice the new skills. So for my project, I focused on limit setting with patients and visitors and created an education module and a role play activity for a cohort of pre-licensure graduate nursing students. The education module was a 10 minute Panopto video with four knowledge check questions that outlined the appropriate usage of limit setting. And then students had to complete this video prior to the role play activity. The role play activity was conducted synchronously on Zoom with 46 students and eight facilitators. For the activity, everyone was put into breakout groups and in the groups there were four to six students and one facilitator to complete six scenarios. The facilitator played the role of the patient or visitor, and then the students played the role of the primary nurse. Short debriefs were conducted after each scenario, and at the end, we came back together to the main uh, Zoom and conducted a debrief with all the students and the facilitators. Students and facilitators were able to provide feedback on the education module and role play activity through an anonymous and optional Qualtrics survey. And the results from the survey were generally pretty positive. 
uh, for the education module, one student felt that the lesson was very applicable to a variety of clinical settings. And one suggestion was that it might have been more helpful to create uh, to include a few more examples of what a good limit setting statement was and how to use it. For the role play activity, there were two suggestions, and for the students, they would like they would have liked more time to complete each of the scenarios, and that the loss of body language over um, the Zoom platform made it kind of awkward or kind of hard to distinguish what to do during some of the scenarios. There's definitely an interest in workplace violence prevention among students and even experienced healthcare workers. So introducing topics such as limit setting and workplace violence and nursing programs can be really important because it allows students to become more aware of workplace violence and to be more confident when they're dealing with workplace violence in the future, especially in the healthcare setting. It also allows students to have uh, opportunities to practice limit setting or de-escalation skills in a safe controlled environment. And lastly, there are two major nursing implications for this project. With further refinement, this module could be very beneficial in uh, nursing programs in the US and even other health programs, because as we know, nursing is not the only uh, profession that experiences workplace violence. And finally, I would like to thank my thesis chair, Dr. Adams, my thesis committee, Dr. Droughton Moret and Dr. Norwood, the MSL cohort, the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing and my family and friends. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, Sarah Stallins, you are next. Okay, one second. Sarah, we can see your screen if you do want to present from there. Are you having trouble putting it in presenter mode? Oh, there you go. Looks like. So we're seeing your uh, presenter screen. Give me one second. OK. Are you doing okay? Yes, I think I'm good. Okay. <laughs> okay, hi. Sorry about that. Okay, let me just... Oh, my, my mouse is being a little funky right now. Um, sorry, one second. I'm... Okay, can you guys hear me and see the screen? We can't see your screen, we can just see you. Can you see my PowerPoint? No. Um, okay, one second. Um, one second. I have to zoom, share screen. There we go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Take the tea. That's it does. I got right my backup there. person here to help me out here. That's okay. All. Hi, okay. So, 
My name is Sarah Stallins, and I will be presenting my apply project, including the development of a creative art class involving homeless male adults. Okay, for some reason, it's not letting me go to the next slide. Uh, wait, hold on. Okay, there it goes. I have, just have to manually click it. Okay, um, a little background. Annually, 1.6 million people utilize transitional housing in the United States. The most substantiated factors as to why men are homeless included social isolation, depression, and addiction. The purpose of this project was to develop and incorporate creative interventions that will provide a positive outlet for homeless men. The intent was to help the homeless feel connected ease the feeling of depression and aid in them being better understood. Munia Khan said it best, let your love be the kindness to make a homeless person believe that a soul needs something more than just four walls and a ceiling. The literature review addressed the unmet needs, including how to reduce barriers through emotional vulnerability and social outlets to help combat homelessness. Numerous studies supported that depression was the most prevalent issue among homeless men and also the most significant reason why psychological support was sought out. The exasperation of depression included little will to live and suicidal attempts. Weakened social support from family and friends contributed to a decline in psychological health, including feeling discouraged to visit their health care provider, Many homeless men reported difficulty relating to others in low quality social connections. Within society, men are directed to control and display self-mastery self by being less sensitive and showing minimal emotional involvement relating to gender role theory, which prevents men from opening up and being vulnerable. Also, lack of housing induced high risk health behaviors such as illicit drug use, alcoholism, and panhandling. Need for meaningful work. The need for meaningful work among the homeless by means through productivity, alleviating boredom and finding value of art can help lead this population toward prosperity. Productive activities such as cleaning or playing cards was found to add meaning. Community integration was a significant challenge for developing support for homeless men. High levels of boredom correlated with low levels of engagement and feelings of belonging. Studies conveyed structured activities and art interventions as a start towards social inclusion and potential for creating housing for the homeless. The value of art has contributed to one sense of well being, improving perceived control, and allowed self expression while expanding social support. The gap. While a vast majority of articles offered up the probable contributing factors, fewer just solutions. The literature substantiates the need for structured activities. Creating an art program can help bridge the gap between social exclusion by providing an opportunity for the homeless to feel connected and engage within their community. Services to address social resources and need for emotional support need to be further investigated. So what is the project? The art class entailed Weaving together square stitch lanyard keychains, gratitude stone painting combined with a focus on mindfulness and gratitude. Given the COVID-19 guidelines, the maximum amount of participants for a class was eight adults. The facilitator, which included myself, guided participants in depicting their art while connecting the meaning to their goals and outcomes. This took place at the Gathering Inn, which is a homeless emergency shelter in Auburn, California. This facility aims to get adults rehabilitated back into society through means of sorting out barriers of housing, generating income, and providing supportive groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. Methods and project findings. Two one-hour art and personal reflection classes were taught, and an evaluation questionnaire was given out at the end of each class. As an incentive to participate, the a prize was distributed to each participant at the conclusion of each class. The project findings include that 50% of the participants reported a positive improvement in their mood and appreciated being listened to among their peers. 
all of the participants reported at least a seven out of 10 sense of connectedness on the one to 10 Likert scale evaluation questionnaire. The gratitude and mindfulness worksheets promoted the groups to openly share what they have gone through along with their personal self-reflection, all of which was on a volunteer basis. Here is a brief overview of the Likert scale evaluation. In I'm the sorry, Sarah, oh. we're at time. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I apologize. No, that's okay. And then, you know, voila, to conclude. So thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Job, Sarah, I'm so sorry. I just <laughs> okay. want to make sure we have time for no, our that's final okay. two presenters. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Um, we have... Um, did I stop my share? Yes, you did. Thank okay, you so okay. much. Uh -huh. So uh, we were going to have Shile go next. Shile, are you ready to present? Yes. Excellent. Yes, I am ready. And thank you everyone for your patience as, um, as we uh, navigate some technical issues. I appreciate it. All right, go ahead, Shile. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shile, and today I will be talking about the impacts of culture on perceptions of intimate partner violence among Fijian Indian women. And um, my objective for this thesis project is to bring awareness around how intimate partner violence impacts minority groups in the United States. I will specifically be talking about how the Fijian Indian community, about the Fijian Indian community and its unique barriers when it comes to seeking help for intimate partner violence. Um, so how does intimate partner violence impact Fijian Indian women? Fijian Indian women are at a higher risk for having poor health outcomes due to intimate partner violence because of colonialism, racism, and their minority status. And now, uh, Fijian Indians are the diaspora population of India, and they were brought to Fiji as indentured servants to work uh, on the uh, colonial sugar refineries. It was basically a global system, a uh, global uh, substitution for slavery after the um, African slavery was abolished. Um, after Fiji gained its independence from Britain, these laborers ended up staying in Fiji. Some stayed because they couldn't leave due to lack of money and others because they were, uh, they grew fond of the island. And um, since then, um, the Fijian Indians have endured racial discrimination from, F from the Fijian government. Uh, because of political unrest and lack of fair opportunity, a lot of uh, Fijian Indians then migrated out of Fiji to places like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. And then in America, uh, Fijian Indians are a minority. And studies show that intimate partner violence is a serious preventable public health problem in the United States that disproportionately impacts ethnic minority women. So the purpose of my study was to determine how cultural views impact Fijian Indian women's perceptions of intimate partner violence. The first objective of the study identified themes in women's perspective. The second uh, objective of the study determined how these themes then ultimately impact Fijian Indian women. I did a qualitative study that followed a phenomenological framework. It was cross-sectional. Um, I interviewed 10 women through virtual interviews and patient participation. It was a semi-structured interview with open-ended questions and uh, participants were recruited on social media platforms and through snowballing. Uh, and results show that intimate partner violence in the Fijian Indian community is normalized and silenced. Uh, if someone experiences intimate partner violence, you won't hear about it because it is seen as a personal matter that can be resolved within a relationship or within the family. Uh, women are expected to tolerate abuse and stay in abusive relationships due to strong emotions towards familism and collectivism. If the community finds out that there's any type of abuse, usually the victim is uh, um, faces shame and judgment of the community, whereas women are blamed for the uh, abuse and they're seen as weak um, if they um, cannot tolerate it or if they leave their partners. Uh, because within the community, a marital bond is considered very sacred and it is something that should be maintained at any cost. Uh, the Fijian Indian culture is very patriarchal in nature, and this is shown in how the family unit is constructed, where the men are the head of the household and women are the caretakers um, and homemakers. Men go out to earn and women stay home and take care of the kids. Uh, this structure, the social structure is uh, maintained by the older generation um, and it has been maintained um, because they've taught the younger generation 
to that this is the social structure that they need to preserve. Um, these teachings are also taught and reinforced through religion, specifically uh, Hinduism, um, which is very patriarchal in nature as well. And it plays a important role in determining how, in determining uh, traditional gender roles. Within uh, religious Hindu texts, you'll find examples of how abused women repeatedly abuse against women are repeatedly justified and women who tolerate abuse are then glorified. Uh, so then what does help look like in the Fijian Indian community? Um, as healthcare providers, it is important to understand that the Fiji, that Fijian Indian women will not freely talk about their uh, experiences with abuse. Therefore, it is important to establish trust before having any conversation about intimate partner violence. When assessing for intimate partner violence, providing privacy is very crucial because women will not talk about abuse in front of anyone. They wouldn't want certain family members or certain people in the community to find out. Uh, so respecting and providing privacy is very uh, important. And then lastly, in order to help women, uh, it's important to determine um, what their needs are. Um, to summarize that, uh, help women where they need help and not where you think help is needed. Um, and in conclusion, cultural factors play a significant role in determining whether women within the community seek, seek help for intimate partner violence. So, and Fijian Indian women will often not seek for um, help, which leads to poor health outcomes. So it's important to be mindful of um, uh, cultural barriers for them. And stop share. Excellent. Thank you so much, Shail. Wonderful presentation. Okay, so we have our final presenter, Riza. Third time is a charm. Um, so I believe that Felix is going to help us out and try and share. And if that doesn't work, we have another backup. So Felix, are you able to share? Yes, working on it. You guys see the screen? Yeah, we can see yes, it now. Yes, we do. Go I right ahead. You. Excellent. Thank you. There okay. you go. You so, just let me know, Risa. Thank you. Okay, I'll let you know. Thank you, Felix. Um, I apologize again. My name is Risa. I, the title of my project is uh, Educational Offering on Navigating Venus Access Devices for Nurses. Next slide, please. Uh, for background, reliable Venus Access Devices. Um, is vital in modern day medical care across different settings. Next slide, please. Um, it is essential for the safe and effective delivery of um, IV medication solutions, blood products, venous pressure monitoring blood draws in today's healthcare. Um, next slide, please. But deciding which VAD has the lowest risk while at the same time meeting the patient's needs can be confusing. It has been reported that 90% of patients will receive at least one VAD during a hospital stay, which makes it the most common invasive procedure for the hospitalized patient. Um, next slide, please. Despite the important roles of VADs, uh, these devices are often associated with um, hospital-acquired complications like catheter-related bloodstream infections, thrombosis, among others. There are different clinician groups involved in a patient's VAD care, but bedside nurses is at the forefront of VAD care and therapy. Um, a survey reported that 75% of all hos uh, of a hospital um, nurses' productive um, hours were um, exhausted providing IV-related services. Next slide, please. Nurses are expected to be highly skilled and knowledgeable about different aspects of bad care, including device selection, based not only on the immediate um, need for access, but also critically thinking the long-term impact of device choice for the patient's vessel health and efficient delivery of treatment. Um, but educational serv in services that are provided to nurses are often fo uh, focused on task-oriented activities such as PIV insertion, dressing changes, bad removal. Um, my institution um, in particular does not have any uh, in services um, related to critical thinking and uh, best practices on device selection, leading to um, a lot of inappropriate um, uh, venous access devices that are um, requiring alternate lines. 
um, so um, the last quarter that we, um, you know, during my needs assessment, uh, my team has received 3,165 um, bad requests and orders. Out of this number, 855 were deemed inappropriate. And out of that 855, 428 were nurse driven. Next slide, please. So like what I said, nurses needs to have educational um, opportunities or learning opportunities that will um, make them better prepared as patient advocates for um, the best or the most appropriate um, um, venous access device. Next slide, please. So for my project aim, I created and pilot tested the acceptability of an education module aimed at enhancing the nurse's knowledge about best practices in managing beds, specifically device selection factors, indications, and contraindications for use in a multimedia format. Next slide, please. So I created a 21 minute multimedia module focused on VADS uh, using the practice guidelines from the Vessel Health and Preservation um, and Magic Frameworks. Um, I used the video creation format called buy -in, and it was made accessible to participants um, by a shared Google Drive and or we transfer. Um, next slide, please. I modified uh, an existing survey and it was self-administered that assessed the participants' characteristics, knowledge, satisfaction, um, and I used Microsoft Excel and uh, descriptive statistics. Next slide, please. These are some um, of what's included in my module. Next slide, please. So that's my module content. Next slide. And then some of the screenshots of what's included in the video. Next slide, please. And then this is just a short a trailer of what the, you know, I'm not going to play it because it's a little long. Um, next slide, please. So for my results, there are 70, 77% uh, out of the 26 potential participants watched the video. The final analysis of um, this project included 20 nurses. Uh, all were practicing and experienced adult med surge nurses, of which 55% completed previous training related to the topic. Overall, participants achieved 100% correct responses on the quiz and favorably rated their satisfaction with the module in the multimedia format. Next slide, please. Uh, for uh, discussion in future project, the interpretation of this pilot project needs caution due to the limitation of the design. Future project may focus on tracking improvement in practice as evidenced by a decrease in nurse-driven inappropriate bad orders or requests. Other patient care areas like the pediatric critical care, emergency care, and other clinician groups like ordering providers who do not have formal curriculum about VAD devices or uh, best practices about uh, VAD um, selection factors may benefit from a similar learning module. Um, it may be beneficial for pre-licensure nursing students and emerging clinicians as well. Next slide. Uh, in conclusion, the project demonstrated the potential for introducing an animated multimedia technology to meet nurses' education needs about best practices in managing VADs um, the module format uh, promoted consistency in instruction delivery and managed learners' time effectively. Um, and developing a concise, innovative, and engaging module could result in positive learning outcomes. Next slide, please. So I want to thank my chair and my committee and also the vascular access nurse team and my hospital and my nurse participants. That's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, so that concludes our session. I wanna ask first though, for another round of applause for our students. They can't hear you, but we know it's happening and that it's loud and enthusiastic. So I wanna say congratulations again to Wendy, Felix, Laura, Riza, Nadine, Ali, Michelle, Sarah, and Shail. Thank you so much for your leadership and for your impactful contributions to nursing and to healthcare. So this concludes our Master of Science and Leadership panel presentations for this morning. It does not conclude our program. We're gonna take a short break and then the webinar will come back on at 11.35 a.m. 
uh, for our very exciting evidence-based practice moderated poster session. You're not going to want to miss it, so I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you so much for joining us and for your patience and your support of our students. Take care, everyone.